It's day two of the great Canadian book debate. We said farewell to the first book yesterday. Another title must go today. Which one will it be? Get ready to find out. I'm your host, Ali Hassan, and this is Canada Reads. This is Canada Reads, Canada's annual title fight. Hello and welcome back. The mission to choose the one book all of Canada should read. We're on the search for one book that will shift your perspective. Who are the panelists joining me on this quest? Let's find out. Hi, I'm Matea Roach. Matea? What's Bhutan? That's correct. Matea? What's Virginia? That's right. Matea. What are the Napoleonic Wars? Right. The answer there is the Daily Double. I'm Championing Ducks by Kate Beaton on Canada Reads. Hi, I'm Gurdeep Pandeer. Gurdeep Pandeer is a Bangor dancer, teacher, and performer from Yukon. Left, right, right. Now, hoo -hoo. now you know one program. Let's dance to the music now. Are you ready? I'm championing Hotline by Dimitri Nasrila. Hi, I'm Keegan Connor Tracy. You may know her as the Blue Fairy on Once Upon a Time. I hear your wish. You don't need to wish it so loudly. <laughs> Well, hello, my fellow readers. I am championing Greenwood by Michael Christie. Hi, I'm Tasneem Geedy. She's known as Groovy Taz on TikTok, where she shares book reviews to over 100,000 followers. Like, I do not believe in their past. I do not believe in their present. I do not believe in their future. He is hot, but that can only take a man so far. <laughs> I'm championing Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno-Garcia on Canada Reads. <laughs> I'm Michael Grayeyes. An actor and director from Muskeg Lake Cree Nation. She's my daughter, and I would take a bullet for her. But honestly, babe, I think she may be a dud. She had the nerve to call me weird. I'm the least weird dad. I'm championing Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel. Joining me around the table are Matea Roach, Gurdip Pandare, Keegan Connor, Tracy, Tasneem Geely, and Michael Grayeyes, your Canada Reads 2023 contenders. All right, the day one debate was a serious feeling out period for the panelists. We had our first vote and first elimination yesterday. In the end, it was a four to one vote against Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno Garcia. It became the first book to be eliminated on Canada Reads this year. Tasneem, you were championing Mexican Gothic, but its author, Silvia Moreno-Garcia, would like to offer you a consolation prize. Have a listen. Tasneem, I will send your very own mushroom farming kit so they can grow multiple types of mushrooms and perhaps eat them or make them into a tea. Mmm, mushroom tea. Supernatural effects are not guaranteed. In rare cases, nightmares may occur. Consult your physician if frightening <laughs> secrets are revealed. Tasneem, those aforementioned nightmares notwithstanding, how are you feeling today? Overwhelmed, oh my God. Yeah, overwhelmed, I think. You know, I'm so honored to be able to be here, to be able, I, don't, I never thought that, you know, talking about my books and finding my passion for reading again through maybe the darkest time of my life and the country's life, to be able to be here to talk to like the smartest people that I know, um, but with somebody with an ego and someone with who loves to compete with themselves and you know their biggest critic, four to one. I was thinking to myself like, damn girl, like not even one person. Hmm. But you know, if I was even able to convince one person to read this throughout this entire process, like that is a win for me. Well, on that note, before we move on, why don't you remind everyone why they should read Mexican Gothic? Yeah, I really want to take the time to speak to the readers who are still on the fence because, you know, it's easy to judge myself now of not being too assertive yesterday, but uh, for some of the concerns that, you know, the book is slow, yes, I do agree, but I don't believe that it's anticlimactic. You know, I think the pacing had to exist for not only to anthropomorphize the house and setting and to really feel the atmosphere, but to really build up that stakes. You know, Sylvia really built up this dread and she continued it throughout and gave such a meaningful climax at the end. It was so satisfying for me. And I didn't really feel, you know, like meh at the end to just, it's not the what, like obviously you know that the Doyle family are evil, like in you from page one, like page two, but the, it's the why, right? It was their audacity. It was the fact that the way that they existed for this long, at the expense of the land that they were occupying, of the people that they were occupying, and why they did what they did, and that the fact that it could still persist was insane to me, and it gave me a lot of pause, and I had to take back and really reflect on that. So, and also, you know, we need to learn more about Noemi. I think that pacing had to exist to like her, because at the beginning, you know, she's vain. You know, she's not the easiest person to like, 
But as we got to see her grow and reflect on the fact that she is, you know, very bougie and she needs to, you know, be humbled a little bit. And the fact that she was able to grow from that, not just from her thoughts, but from her actions. I love that Sylvia gave her the time to grow for me to love her. And as somebody who's in academia and who loves their makeup, I am with her 100%. Like, she is me. I love her and I think she's such a strong female character for young women of color to see a character that doesn't have to exist in stereotypes. And I love the fact that Sylvia went against that. And on that note, um, actually, no, I think that's a good note to end off. I love this book. I think it's worth your time. I think it's really important to read books that you don't think will, you know, that you expect because I think they have the power to surprise you. And yeah, read right. Mexican Gothic. Thank you, Tasneem. Yeah. Your passion definitely showing through. All right, let's turn to the four great books that are still on the table. Tasneem is actually our first free agent, which uh, makes her very dangerous. Do you feel dangerous? You know, I don't hold a grudge. It's Ramadan. Trying to be in the spirit, okay. so All right. I'm ready we'll to see. be wooed. We'll see about <laughs> where that goes, uh, but take heed because Tasneem's support panelists, or or lack thereof, could change this game. <laughs> the remaining titles are Ducks by Kate Beaton, championed by Matea Roach, Hotline by Dimitri Nasrallah, backed by Gurdip Bandeer, Greenwood by Michael Christie, chosen by Keegan Connor Tracy, and Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel, which is championed by Michael Gray Eyes. So today we're gonna have four rounds of debate. We're gonna kick each round off with an opening statement. So you will get 60 seconds to tell us what makes the book you are championing a great book. And then we'll launch into the discussion around the Canada Reads table. It's time to debate. It's day two of Canada Reads. We're gonna mix things up a bit. I don't want to blow your mind. We're going counterclockwise around this table. <laughs> um, these debate rounds are, uh, are, are, are going to be counterclockwise. Michael, you're on my right, so you will be up first. You're championing Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel. It is a dystopian novel where a global pandemic wipes out 99% of the population. It follows the lives of several characters before and after this world-changing event. I'm giving you 60 seconds. What makes Station Eleven a great book? In terms of craft, Station Eleven is dazzling. Um, the structure follows five characters whose lives intertwine over four distinct time, time frames. Um, yet the narrative unfolds in a completely non-linear way. We skip back and forth through time. Uh, a question or mystery set up in one time frame, then answered or explained in another, always driving us forward. Emily's descriptive powers astound. Um, her sentences are, are so full, uh, one detail layered on top of another. Uh, they accrete, leaving these gorgeous mounds of image and emotion. Um, her use of motif is just as powerful. Um, circles, light. You know, the prophet says he is the light. Uh, the opening line is Lear standing in a pool of light. And at the end, in the terminal, when Kirsten sees the town lighting up in the distance, um, gorgeous. Thank you, Michael. All right, you heard what Michael has to say, everyone. What do you think? Tasneem, let's start with you. Yeah, you know, for me going into this book, I was really nervous because as someone who works in healthcare, has a family who works in healthcare, I, I, don't, I didn't think that I wanted to read about a pandemic book. And, you know, reading it, it was really soothing. And I like what you also said yesterday about how, you know, morality, sorry, memory, and also art is kind of a form of survival for these characters. And I love the way how Emily wrote that Miranda in the beginning. She just wrote Station Eleven just because she wanted to. And then you get to see that in the Shakespeare, in like the Traveling Symphony that they just performed because they wanted to. And I love that. And as somebody who, again, like needed to read to, you know, get through this pandemic, I really appreciated that part of the story and how she included that. In terms of the structure, when you're talking about the nonlinear storytelling, I did agree. I do love nonlinear storytelling, especially when you can clearly see that she's alluding to something at the end, that there's going to be this big reveal, and especially with the, you know, they're already going through a pandemic, but they're also going through the prophet. And I love the introduction of that character, but I really would have loved to see more... What's the word I'm looking for? It's like a more, it's, it was very unsatisfying to me and how they ended up resolving it because, you know, they led up to this idea of, he's, of him being, you know, such a bad guy. And then it was kind of resolved very quickly at the end, which was very weird because of the way how she set up, you know, these huge stakes, but it didn't really feel resolved to me at the end. Mm. But yeah, but I love so much about it, surprisingly, but yeah. Mm, thank you. You know, I think, I think the prophet is a really fascinating character mm -hmm. in, in Station Eleven. Uh, because again, like, like, you know, 
these dystopian novels, period novels, they're mirrors. And that sort of thread of evangelism, of fanaticism, religious fanaticism, of course it plays out now. Um, mm -hmm. I think what was really fascinating to me about that climax was um, that it was his own people that actually took him out. Right. You know, like we expected this like huge confrontation, but actually within that world, that, you know, that world of fanaticism, there's like varying levels of belief. And to me, that felt really organic. It felt real. You know, people that are going along, but are they, are they true believers or are they sort of there for protection for other reasons? And um, for me, that was I, was, I was really profoundly affected by the death because the young boy that shot the prophet um, then turned the gun on himself. Right. And so in a way, um, you know, the, the, it collapsed in on itself, that whole belief system. So I, I feel that was really an important way to frame it. Keegan, let me ask you, and Tasneem said something interesting, which is that a book that centers around the pandemic sort of helped you get through the pandemic. I want to know what your thoughts are about that and, and about uh, Station Eleven in general. That's interesting because I, I've, I had a different perspective on that entirely. In fact, it was the last book I read in my first round and I really struggled. Like, I was like, I can't read this book. It just felt, I think it hits really close to home. And in fact, you know, when we see how poorly we did with COVID, which was like a baby flu, to mm. think of, of something as serious as that and to know that we would utterly fail it was, I felt really demoralized. I found a lot of times I wouldn't read it at night because I just did not want that vibe going to bed. Mm -hmm. um, there was, uh, my second pass, I found I really, really liked this book, actually. I, there was a lot of things that I could see that I didn't see the first time, both by the nature of what, how I was reading for this competition. Um, and in the end, I liked it very much, but I struggled with the pandemic piece. I struggled with the whole religious fundamentalism that gets me in a place that I do not groove on. Um, but I did really like this book more than I was expecting after my first pass. Mm. I will say, this is just my one thing, I, I like it so much as a book, but I I didn't feel like it really shifted my perspective. Um, I, I think it, it reminded me of like Nicole Kidman saying, yes, art is important. And I, and I agree with that. Obviously, I'm an actor, I'm a director, I'm a writer, I'm a storyteller at heart. Uh, and, and that is something that I think I was really drawn to and I think is really beautiful about this book. Um, but the Station Eleven comic book part, not comic book, graphic novel, uh, I just didn't see how that... I didn't enjoy what it added, and I also didn't really feel like the intertwined character thing played out in a strong way. I don't think it's, I mean, I still think it's a really great book. I just think those are my little things about it. Yeah, I think a lot of people talk about, um, uh, in this novel, about how art and what, what, what that means in terms of, you know, uh, how it's you know, a form of human expression, how we make community around it. I think one of the important things to take away from the novel um, comes actually through, the, through Clark's story. Um, you know, in the Starship uh, uh, chapter, there's a little note, a grace note at the end, when the 360 project is introduced, and then that fabulous person that he's interviewing, Dahlia, is introduced, and she said, oh yeah, my boss, Dan, Dan, he's like a high-functioning sleepwalker. And that's actually crucial because that's, the, that's in a way the thesis of the entire mm -hmm. novel. Like, are like we, we, are all high are we like alive? Yeah. Are, we, mm -hmm. are we really functioning? You know, the pandemic in this place is a catalyst. It's a catalyst to see what, what remains, who we are. But in that moment, it really actually describes um, uh, our current state. Can we move beyond, um, you know, sort of these, these, you know, shadows, these sort of echoes of a life and really live. And I think coming out of the pandemic, um, I'm reminded in those moments when you know, we were really scared and alone mm -hmm. that we sought each other out and that we did build community. So you know, that's something that I, I, I really profoundly um, take away from the novel. And the nature of fame too, if I may, mm -hmm. just I really do think it's shone a, a spotlight on that in this culture right now where everybody like is, I wanna be, uh, you know, that kids, their number one thing in America that they say they wanna be is an influencer. Like this is the world that we're in and this lays that bare and shows how right. utterly meaningless it is in the face yeah. of something as big as a pandemic, well, a real a pandemic. voices in here. Gurdeep, what are your thoughts on this book? Um, I think it's a beautiful book. Uh, this book remarkably shows uh, how fragile the human life is. Like that was my big reflection on this book. Um, like people going through pandemic and suddenly 99% of the world population is gone. And uh, then even after that uh, post-apocalyptic uh, 
time, like people are struggling, they're missing the old world, they're missing the technology, uh, they're missing their loved ones, they're missing the connections. Uh, uh, like, like, even the world we are living in present time, like we have technology, we have science, we have medicine, we have everything, we have 911, uh, but anything can happen anytime. That was very beautifully presented. Even the book was written in, uh, um, uh, in 14, but uh, many years before the actual mm -hmm. pandemic, but it gives that uh, great gl glimpse. And, uh, and also um, that the motto, we've, uh, the, uh, the survival is insufficient. Uh, I like that motto on, on the caravan, um, like that how all those characters, uh, they are lying on music, uh, singing, dancing, theater, not only to fulfill their basic needs, but uh, doing more than that, like creating entertainment, creating joy, which is also very important uh, at that time. Um, yeah, I, I, I like the, the, the intertwine of all those uh, uh, five characters too. Okay, we'll have to leave it there. That is it for this round. Okay, Tasneem is sitting next to Michael, free agent, as we said, so we're gonna skip past you, Tasneem, no offense. Intended. Keegan, you're next to Tasneem. That means it is your turn. You are championing Greenwood by Michael Christie. It is a novel that spans several generations of the Greenwood family. It explores how secrets and lies can impact the past, the present, and the future. 60 seconds are on the clock. What makes Greenwood a great book? Greenwood is a great book that is accessible, but it is still dense enough to really please a, a, a real, you know, a literary reader with complicated characters and complex themes. It is lyrical and tender. It's a little dystopian, and it's all wrapped up in this good old family saga. It takes us on this great chase across Canada, binding us to these layered characters that we can really fall in love with or hate, which is great. Uh, I think it was really easy to become invested in, like, Everett's lifelong battle to just be part of a family and this loping villain Lomax always after him to lament Harris's inability to live his truth. I was exasperated with Willow and her lunatic idealism, but I also kind of admired it. I was angry about Jake's refusal of salvation, which made me kind of question my own moral code. And always there's just this lush description of this beautiful country and forever this call echoing through the trees to fight fiercely for the people and the land that we love lest we lose them forever. Thank you. All right. Uh, panelists, you just heard what Keegan had to say about Greenwood. What do you think? Matea, let's start with you. Yeah, so I think, you know, Keegan, you talked so much about characterization and just the compelling stories of the struggles of all of these different people and the way that they're intertwined together. My thing about Greenwood that I kind of struggled with as I was reading it is I did not feel like every sort of main character, right, because of the way that the book is structured around the rings of the tree, we get these four very distinct time periods that we're talking about. I felt that the core of the tree, the sort of heartwood, if you will, the story of Harris and Everett was incredibly well developed and I was very, very compelled by it. I found the story of Jake, which is the first thing that we get introduced to and also how the book wraps up, uh, has an immediate fascination because we almost have this like dystopian, post-apocalyptic kind of world where we have this like fungus that's destroyed so much of the world's biodiversity. My problem was that because we stayed in these very discrete time periods, I don't think I got as much connection as I might have wanted between the different generations of the family, particularly those middle uh, people with Willow and Liam. I think we see relatively little of Willow's childhood growing up of how maybe Harris like radicalized her into being this sort of reactionary uh, environmental activist where she's responding to uh, his, you know, industry and the way that he operates. We get a little bit more of Liam growing up as a kid, you know, having this itinerant lifestyle with Willow, but still relatively little because we're staying in these four specific years. And so I found myself, once I got through the center part of the book, feeling like it was a bit of a slog going through the remainder of Willow's story and the remainder of Liam's story because I just did not really feel as invested in their arcs as I was in that heartwood of Harrison Everett. And then uh, I think this was mentioned yesterday. I found the ending of the book a little bit unsatisfying, but I'll let maybe some other folks talk about that. Well, Keen, I'll let you respond to that. 
Yeah, I, you know, I don't disagree with you. I think if you were to ask me who were sort of my least favorite characters, I would say it's Willow. She made me crazy. And, and I don't know, and to some degree that's good. It's the thing that you can sit around a table and talk about. Um, I, I think if you just liked everybody, it wouldn't be quite such a great tale. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do, I was more invested also in Harrison Everett, and in particular Everett, and I loved Temple. And so I do think that sort of the bookending characters were perhaps more interesting than those middle ones. And I, I, I know what you're talking about, about the ending and in fact when I was reading it and I was saying I'm gonna pick this book I'm pretty sure this is the book but let me finish it and I got to the end and I was mad I was like I don't think this is the book and I had to really step back from it and I actually had to go back in and reread why she made that refusal and discover that she was right mm -hmm. uh, you know and I had to really ask myself why I was so angry about her and I, why I was so angry about Willow turning away that money because mm -hmm. I was like I would take that money and I would have kept mm -hmm. that island mm -hmm. but it, it made me ask questions about why I felt that way mm -hmm. why I would have been so quick to I, abandon my idealism in a way that she was unwilling to do. Yeah, my issue wasn't so much with the characters' decisions, because I think you're right. Like, books are not interesting if all of the characters are likable all of the time. I think my issue was more with, like, the substantiation and, and allowing me as the reader to understand the logic behind those decisions mm -hmm. could have had a little bit more work, right? I want to be mad, but also understand. Understand why you're mad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I buy that. Let and me get I think some, some other of that voices is the scope of a too. big book, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Great. Michael, your thoughts on Um You know, this is a, a thrilling novel. It's like beautifully written. Um, I, had a, I had an issue with the Hartwood chapter, 1908. Mm -hmm. You know, like in terms of the voicing, you know, omniscient voicing are, are you know, very often neutral. And that voicing changed in 1908. It was re really problematic Where it for had me. the townspeople. Yes, yep. yeah. And so, you know, I, I was reading things and it said like, so, you know, these two boys are orphaned and you know, they needed a home, but no one volunteered. I was like, oh my God, how heartless, <laughs> cold. Um, people, yeah. They said, uh, you know, we picked one of the boys to stay in school because he was less dangerous, you know, like the cowardliness of that. And then there was a comment about the Mohawks that they had to like, um, you know, dispossess this band of Mohawks. Um, it was a brutal yet necessary act that we all did. And I thought to myself, I was like, that is so problematic that, that this statement happens in the middle of the book, the, the alive part of the book, right? Who's saying that? Is that an indictment of, of Canada, of, of Canadians in our, in our history? It was really disturbing because it was never answered. It just sat in the middle of the book like a, like a lump of coal. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying, and I, I've had the same feeling about the way it sort of took you out of this narrative that you were sort of in, in and then all of a sudden there was this other voice that never appeared again. Uh, and all I could do was sort of chalk it up to the device to give us the information we needed to know about how these kids ended up together, where they ended up with Mrs. Craig, et cetera. Um, but, you know, I, I hear it. Uh, I, I accept that criticism on behalf of Michael. <laughs> Michael. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because in the end, you know, you know, it, it lives in the middle of the book, but it doesn't like echo out like like rings. Like it doesn't echo out into these people. And and as you know, oh, other well, people I would have said with that, I think every piece of it, the the point of that sort of cross cut of these lives is to show. And how I really interpreted it is, you know, you can say, oh, Harris was a terrible father. Why was he such a terrible father? But then we look back at a time when there was no disability, a sense of somebody having a disability and any allowance for that. And there certainly was no allowance for this man to be gay. That's very clear that. He stood to lose everything and, and in fact did because of that. And I, I think that tells you why he was the kind of father he was with Willow, which then informs why Willow was how she was with Liam. And all of the twisted ways in which, you know, it's so easy to make a blanket statement, you're a bad father, you're a bad, what a bad mother, and then you look back. And it really forced me in the way that I talked about with Little Life to look at my own, you know, I have a very, problematic relationship with my father and this made me have to re-examine it and find forgiveness for the places where he did not measure up. Yeah. Asneem, I've seen your eyes starting back and forth. Um, clearly, do you have yeah. some thoughts about Greenwood? It's kind of the same, I was, I'm sort of in the same position that I was yesterday after our conversation. I went back into Greenwood and I was reading it again and I love this idea of an eco-apocalypse and I love the no, no I love this idea of the eco apocalypse and I also love the middle of the story so much because I love the idea of a found family and finding again like family can mean so many different things I know that personally so I really love that part of the book I really wish that that 
was just transported out and it was its own book and then we could have had a different conversation on environmentalism because like they were, uh, I think it was Matei who was saying that she wanted to know more about why, they wanted to know more about why Willow was environmentalist that they were because to me, they just felt shallow and I do believe that you need to have unlikable characters but I still need to know the motivation for it and I felt like that kind of lacked from it but I'm still a little upset about Jacinta and it's, and it's not just about the money, it's also about their ideals and I did not understand to have that such a crazy 180, 360 turnaround with their character development to make the decision that they did. And I just, and it overshadowed for me loving the middle of the book because there's so many annotations with me in the middle. I'm like, like I wanted to yell at Harris so many times. Yes, yes. And, I, and I think that just overshadowed that because I believe the middle of the story is so beautiful and I want to see that in like a 10 episode, like episode arc. But the eco-apocalypse, like the way that it wasn't really satisfied at all, well, just, yeah, I, it kind of just I, overshadowed for me. We'll have to I, leave it there, oh, everyone. Oh. That is it for this round. <laughs> We've discussed two books in the running. Uh, we have two more titles that we're going to talk about. But before we do that, panelists, let's take a break. Sit back, relax, kick off your shoes. <laughs> Maybe don't kick off your shoes. That's, that's a bit too comfortable. But we do have something for you to check out. My little gray eyes. This is Gawanerde Debrie Jacobs. I am so thrilled to see you compete this year in Canada Reads. If anyone can win this whole thing, it's Terry Thomas himself from Rutherford Falls. <laughs> Channel him. Know your themes and arguments for each day. You make all of Indian country so proud in all that you do. Let's add Canada Reads Champ to that very decorated belt of yours. Uh -huh. Give him hell. <laughs> hey, Matea, it's Amy Schneider. Aww. I heard you were going to be on TV debating the merits of Ducks by Kate Beaton with some other panelists. Uh, and I just want to say that as somebody that has competed against you and has heard many of your debating war stories from your past, I am glad I'm not one of the other panelists because you are going to crush them. Uh, very kindly and sweetly and politely, of course. <laughs> and besides, anyway, it's like Kate Beaton, like Matea and Kate together, unstoppable. Go get them. Keegan, it's your old friend Jenny Goodwin here. Ever so in awe of you. I have surely read every book you have ever recommended. I find your taste to be layered, intelligent, and fun. Your range is like your other talents, vast. And anyway, I obviously hope you and your book pick win. I love you. Bye. Thank you. Gurdeep, it's your old pal, Brittle Star. I am so proud of everything you've done. Being positive and joyful is your superpower but it is also your greatest weakness. And your Canada Reads opponents know that too. You might expect me to tell you to drop the whole hope, joy, and positivity bit for this contest, but I want you to double down on it. When they go nice, you go nicer. Make them happy cry. Good luck, Gradeep. Bon chance. You annoyingly happy person. <laughs> Those are the voices of right. Michael's Rutherford, Rutherford Falls co-star and past Canada Reads winner, Devery Jacobs, Matea's fellow Jeopardy competitor, Amy Schneider, Keegan's Once Upon a Time co-star, Jennifer Goodwin, and Gurdeep's pal and fellow social media star, Brittle Star, a.k.a. Stuart Reynolds. I'm Ali Hassan, and this is Canada Reads on CBC and Sirius XM. Let's get back to the debate. Deep, you are next to Keegan. That means it is your turn. You are champion, championing Hotline. It's a novel about a single mom and her son and how they leave behind a civil war in Lebanon to live a hard life in Montreal in the 1980s. You have 60 seconds. What makes Hotline a great book? Hotline is all about creating fresh perspective about immigrants in Canada. The pro protagonist, Muna's determination to put one step forward despite the struggles, the pains she goes through, uh, it shows us the, the pains and struggles uh, newcomers they have to face to build their life in Canada. The writing structure is character-driven, uh, free from uh, shocking plot changes. The power of writing structure lies in showing those details in single parenting, loss, war, and still moving on. The writing style is easy to follow. The author includes a word or two from uh, protagonist Muna's uh, uh, mother tongue and French too, allowing uh, readers to appreciate the culture she comes from. Uh, the writing has presence of very heavy emotions, but author manages to find it a way to ground the readers. 
Thank you, Gurdeep. All right, panelists, you just heard what Gurdeep had to say. Um, what do you think? Keegan, let's start with you. Oh, gosh, you always start with me. Okay, I mean, there was... Uh, I think that this truly is a book that can shift perspectives. For people who don't understand or know the immigrant experience, I think it's very eye-opening, uh, and it, it's very successful in that light. Um, I, 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 I empathize with a lot of it. I come from a single mother. We were, like, broke as heck, just the same as, as Muna. I was a latchkey kid. Like, I really identified with a lot of that story. Um, I did have issue with some of the things like, for example, th that she would move to Canada and with the aim of being a French teacher and yet would not prepare her child at all to, to enter that society to teach him French, even though she was reading French to him, for example, back in Beirut. Um, I found it odd that she would not have applied for any other jobs in those three months um, in terms of, you know, if you're really like kind of trying to survive like Winnie did. Winnie was an accountant, but she was cleaning house so that she could be home for her children. So a lot of the things that she was lamenting and, and really struggling with, I think she wasn't necessarily addressing in the way that could have solved them. Um, and, and yet, I get it. Like, I moved to another country. I know what that's like. I know how hard it is. We talked a lot about working in a second language and how exhausting it is. Um, and I really did appreciate that about it. I loved the heart of that when she found that community. I will say, like, I thought that was such a beautiful piece of that story. I found it really bleak. Uh, and, and it's a genius device, really, because it was like the winter and it was hard. And then when we get the, 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 the denouement of the book, it's in the spring and it's coming alive and you feel that sense at the end of the book and I really did appreciate that and I felt a sense of hope at the end but I did find through the the middle of it I was like whoa you know it was a bleak Montreal winter that the, the heart of that book. Gurdip, yeah. why don't you respond to Thank it? you Keegan, thank you for your input. So, um, I feel that in my view that uh, that she was applying for all the jobs like she was going to place to place uh, like collecting all the newspapers and uh, highlighting them and then phoning them uh, and the thing is that people were not responding to her like people were not uh, uh, employers were not prepared to give her the job uh, the based on because she's a newcomer she's a single mom uh, and uh, she's uh, she's just starting her life uh, she had so so many barriers uh, and she finally did accept a job which nobody was able to accept. A lot of people were quitting that job. Uh, uh, like, she was making all the effort. Like, she, she was trying to uh, tell her son, hey, do this, do that, uh, uh, make some more friends in the school so that he can uh, more uh, build a friendly uh, uh, atmosphere in the school. So, so she did uh, uh, make those efforts so that, uh, that she can uh, uh, restart her life in, in Canada. Does name your thoughts? Yeah, um, a lot. I agree with a lot of what Keegan said. Um, I have a very unique experience with Hotline. You know, both my parents immigrated here from Somalia. They both couldn't translate their degrees when they came here. So I know so many Munas, number one being my mom. And because of that, and I already knew so much about it, I kind of left it like, okay, yeah, I know. I completely get it. And because of that, and I know, we all know that. Right now, one in four Canadians are immigrants, right? I really wish that, you know, this definitely is an educational book for people who are unfamiliar with the immigrant experience, but I really wish she also catered it to those that who are and who already understand this story very intimately. Like, I really wish there was an extra layer of depth. And I think the best way they could have done that is understanding more about her son. Mm -hmm. I really wish we could have gotten his extra perspective, even if it was just a few quick scenes, just to understand how he, mm -hmm. you know, you know, Assimilate, not assimilate, I really don't like that word, but just a, accustomed to living in this country, to not knowing French, and because he had so many problems and issues, but I didn't get to see any of that. And also with her husband. And perhaps I, instead of Halim, yeah, there was a lot of Halim and I not love, a lot of Not a lot about the son, and if there was gonna be a lot of Halim, Halim, sorry, I wish I could have seen a bit more of their happy moments together, so that when the ending happened, and I did cry at the end, like on the, tra on the train, which was not fun, but <laughs> you know, even the fact that we did get to see what happened to him, I really wish that we could have seen a few more moments between Winna and, um, Simona and her husband together as well. But aside from that, I uh, I'm someone right now who's learning their mom, like relearning their mom at this stage in my life. And this story helped me reflect on that. And I'm so grateful for this story, but I really wish there was just a little extra for me. Yeah, and thank you, Tajneem. Um, it's great. Um, uh, the reason that uh, there's um, less focus on um, some some those parts, you just mentioned that, that author had to build up the story of uh, like what happened during the war, uh, why she is in present state, uh, what build up to lead her to the, the present situation. So uh, uh, like every book, 
like author has to create a balance to put some more things, has to skip a few things. So I feel that the, like building that background and so that readers, they, they, they can understand the present. Because to understand the present, it's very important to understand the past. So all those uh, flashbacks from the war, uh, the killings and all that stuff, and uh, so that thus we can understand, we can uh, recognize uh, her emotions, uh, recognize the cries she's going through. Uh, I think uh, uh, they, they also need uh, the importance. Yeah, and I think the length, I'm so sorry, I think also the length kind of didn't work in its favor as much as I really wish maybe an extra 50 pages could have been done for that because it was a really quick book. Like I read it, I think, in a day. But I feel like with that extra 50 pages, I could have gotten a more fuller picture than what it was. But I completely agree. With yeah, two sorry. minutes left, Mattia, let me turn to you. Mm -hmm. I want to circle way back something uh, to something, Gurdip, that you mentioned in your original remarks, which was this idea of like the incorporation of words from Arabic into the book. And I thought that that was a really smart choice, uh, just in terms of like really showing for those readers, like Tasneem, you said, this is maybe a book that's more geared towards people that are not personally familiar with the immigrant experience, like literally showing people, well, this is how you think if you're living in a country where your mother tongue is not primarily spoken, there are still these certain things that are idiomatic that are going to come into your thoughts and come into your day to day language. One thing that I do wish, and I'm almost curious if this was like a deliberate editorial choice to enhance that experience for the reader. I have read books before where they do this same thing of incorporating a different language into the book. And then at the back of the book, there's gonna be some kind of yeah. reference or glossary. I'm somebody where I like to read my books in paper and I wanna have my phone like completely in another room. But if I see a word in a language that I don't speak, I know some of the Arabic words that were used, but not all of them. I found myself like wanting to pull out my phone and look it up, which kind of takes me out of the experience. Yes. I almost wondered if that was a purposeful choice to not have the glossary so that you even more are like immersed in this experience of not totally understanding did the language look, and culture. Did you look them up? Because I looked them up and I think that's why. I did, I did look them up yeah. and some of them we can't say on television. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's supposed to also be like unapologetically Arabic. Yeah. And I love that. Like yeah. he didn't have so, to explain his existence. That's it what just I'm thinking is. is like, I'm really glad that it wasn't incorporated into the main text of the story because I never like reading a book where it's like, and I said this, which means that, because that's not how people are thinking. But was it yeah. hiding the derisive nature of those towards this country and, and, and her experience there? Like, it, did yeah, it? Yeah, I kind of like wanted there to be the section at the back where I could go look, but I think you're right. It might be just due to the nature of a lot of it being like swear words that perhaps yeah. the publisher <laughs> doesn't want like the Arabic swear yeah. words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I just yeah. appreciate yeah. it so it's, it's much. It's that community. Mm -hmm. It's about communicating to that community. Yeah. Totally, yeah. We're outside of it. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, it does enhance the experience. Like I know um, living in the Yukon, people who are coming from uh, Nova Scotia, they became, bring the Nova Scotian colors with them, people who are from Quebec, they bring their own language. So, deep, so bringing we have to leave that it there, language so. brings that beautiful cultural color into the book. Thank that you. is it for this round. Thank you. Okay, Matea, you're sitting next to me on my left, so you are last, not least. You are championing ducks by Kate Beaton. It is a graphic memoir. It recounts the time that Kate spent working in the Alberta oil, oil sands with the goal of paying off her student loans she winds up learning more about herself and the harsh world mm -hmm. that we live in. Uh, we're giving you 60 seconds. Mm -hmm. What makes Ducks a great book? All right, so Ducks is one person's story. Kate acknowledges this, I believe, at the intro to the book. She acknowledges it and the uh, sort of end section as well. What it is, is it is a portal into a very specific time and a very specific experience that then serves as a portal essentially into broader conversations. We get context at the top through maps showing people where the various uh, oil sands actual work sites are. We get character guides to kind of introduce us to the cast of characters who work there. What I really want to focus on is the panel structure and the fact that this contains a lot less writing than the other books, but I think that that's a feature and not a bug. We see these beautiful double page spreads that illustrate just the vast of the work sites that Kate is at, which are pictures that we often don't see in news that discusses the oil sands. We see things that are really artistically done, like entirely black pages to demonstrate the feeling of just total emptiness and desolation after Kate has experiences of sexual assault and gender-based violence in the camps. I think that that's something that is totally unique to Ducks compared to the other books in this competition. Thank you, Matea. All right, panelists, you just heard what Matea has to say. What do you think? Michael, let's start with you. Um, I love that Ducks is in the competition. I think, I think the inclusion of a graphic novel is a really important statement uh, around the form. Um, the issue that I had with the book um, is I think an endemic to a larger like uh, cultural Canadian issue, mm -hmm. uh, Ducks. Ducks refers of course to the 300 ducks that land 
in the tailings pond and that die, and that creates a lot of bad press for you know, Sin Crude or whoever it was, you know, mm -hmm. whosever pond it was. And <clears throat> the use of ducks as a title places um, Kate and the workers, like their ducks, mm -hmm. right? They landed in the middle of this thing and, and you know, it's, it's killing them mm -hmm. or to varying degrees. But I reject that because the ducks had no idea what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Kate and everyone involved in, in extraction are adults mm -hmm. and they know that. And, and I, they go in blindly, all these adults who, sh who know better, who should know better. They go into the middle of this thing and they do it and they make their money and then they go, you know what? Wow, I really re regret doing that. Mm -hmm. Wow, I really feel bad. And yet they take what they needed, mm -hmm. they extracted what they needed and left and went home. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think the, the comparison between, you know, these, these innocent ducks and, and adults that knew better, mm -hmm. like leaves, leaves this weird taste in my mouth. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really fair critique. I think for me, what I mostly get out of the metaphor of ducks is actually to do with the fact that the ducks landing in the tailings pond became international news and the fact that 300 ducks died, which yes, is a tragedy, gets so much more cover than the actual, you know, horrors of the extractive industry, than the mental health crises that do affect workers there. To the point of this thing of like, well, people kind of know what they're getting into. I agree that especially in contemporary times, you know, particularly now when we have stories like this that come out, yes, people perhaps are making an informed decision to go into this industry that they know is uh, perhaps deeply unethical, that they know is premised on like extraction of resources from stolen land and all of these things. I think one character that really stuck with me out of the non-Kate characters in this book was Ambrose, who refers to himself as still a fisherman, I'm just out here. And I think that that's representative of like the decision-making calculus that goes into a lot of these folks moving out there, right? Yes, they may be making making an informed decision. I think a lot of the characters that are not Kate are making a much more informed decision than she is, where she's you know, young and presents herself as a bit naive. Um, they're there because they feel like they have no other option, right? Whether or not that's true, that is how they feel. And in the case of characters like Ambrose, where the sort of presumption is that he's a former cod fisherman, when the cod stocks became totally depleted, he could literally no longer work in the industry that he would prefer to work in. He's out here not totally by choice. So I, th I think there's like interesting conversations about agency uh, that come out of this, for sure. Gurdeep, I see a lot of nodding. Let's get you in this. What are your thoughts on ducks? Um, I feel that it's, it's, it's a beautiful book. Um, uh, I spent time, as I mentioned yesterday, in Mau and also in Fort McMurray areas, so I could connect to the both areas. Uh, apart from uh, what uh, um, uh, has mentioned, I also like the way isolation, loneliness, uh, and other forms of mental health that is portrayed in this book. Um, like people struggling, uh, people going through, uh, feeling the peer pressure. Uh, uh, even the men, they are feeling the peer pressure and they are succumbing to those peer pressure, being away from the families. Uh, people are doing things which they should not be doing. Uh, yes, uh, um, it was very sad to learn about all those incidents such as uh, uh, sexual violence and all that, those things. And, and, and it, it has this connection with the with environmental factor too, uh, uh, like uh, uh, the damage uh, which is being caused uh, to environment uh, and the repercussions are out of that. Uh, uh, all these elements, uh, uh, they are leading me to describe it as, as, as a very beautiful book. Keegan, we have about... Um, Two hard minutes left. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I am nodding along, and there's a lot that this book did make me think a lot after I put it down, both times. Um, and where I do think it, it lacks in sort of character development, like you're saying Ambrose, and I can't put a name to, <laughs> a face to that name, mm -hmm. and I felt like that a lot. Even the guy that was in the trailer yesterday, I was like, oh, him, but I don't know his name. Um, mm -hmm. But w what it lacks in that, it had a power of like storyboarding. I, I saw it a lot like that as a director. Mm -hmm. And I will say, and I, I uh, it will never leave me. The, uh, those four black squares were so powerful. And that tells you the power of this as a medium that I had never had experience with before. Um, and I think it's really important. Uh, I, I just thought it was obviously, you know, for anybody who has that experience, it just was like, pow. And that will never leave me, ever. Um, 
And it makes me think about the importance of things like there's an organization called Be More Than a Bystander. And I think if that had been around in that workplace or in many of our workplaces, so much could change. It's about not just letting those things go by. And I think that was something that really popped up for me. And I hope people will look into organizations like this. I hope they will show up in more workplaces mm -hmm. because obviously, this was a, a broken and a very sick place to work. Mm -hmm. 30 seconds, Tasneem. Talk very fast, if I guess. The ducks, I was blown away of how vulnerable her writing was despite not including that many words. The four black squares, so much about Kate's story and how she was talking to her friends and the way how she was able to really show the aggressively masculine world of the oil sands. And I agreed with so much with Michael said and I was talking about it yesterday is just, again, with the whole intersectionality of it all. Yes, you know, you can definitely acknowledge your agency, but you need to reflect on that because it's, Yes, you know, as someone who is a student and is also dealing with debt crisis, you do also have to kind of acknowledge your role in the mass scheme of things. And I completely agree that I know so many people who work in the Alberta oil sense that they have to work there. But again, it's just that moment of reflection that I mentioned yesterday. But I think I agree with both of what they said. We'll have to leave it there. <laughs> yes. Thank you. That is it for this round. Okay, we have heard a lot today about each of the books. Quite a day, quite a discussion. We're not done yet. I'm going to give you one last chance to champion your book before we head into today's elimination vote. Michael, one last chance to persuade the panel that Station Eleven should stay on the Canada Reads bookshelf. You have 30 seconds. Uh, Station Eleven poses huge questions about um, being alive, about what it means uh, to create community. I think in the character of Clark Thompson, you know, he's sort of adjacent to like the most famous character in the book, yet, yet he's the center of the story. He becomes the center of the story and he's the final voice that we hear. And the final voice that we hear is uh, a voice that promotes community. You know, he's, he's the curator of the Museum of Civilization. Oh, that went past. Mm -hmm. That's 30 seconds. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Okay, your final chance, Keegan. Um, Make okay. a case for why Greenwood should not be eliminated today. 30 seconds are on the clock. I think it's there's a difficult mix between like what's a great book for to shifting your perspective and what's a great book that you can say to just about anybody. Like you could read this book and you're going to love it. I think it's one of those kinds of books. I think in terms of um, the con this country as a character is something I really love about it. I really do think it can shift your perspective on like why did this happen in my family? Like yes, I'm angry at my dad for the way he wasn't there, but now I look back and I go, but this happened and this happened. And I think not only can we do that in our immediate families, but I think we need to do that as a country. And I think the environment, environmental message in there. Thank you. Also, Keegan. Means that. <laughs> what an Kardeep. ending that was. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> You're next, Kardeep. You have 30 seconds to convince your fellow panelists that Hotline should stay another day on Canada Reads. I'm here to talk about building interracially connected Canada. But this is not possible if we continue to create polarizations. We have to look into eyes of those we have been avoiding so far. We need to fall in love with those we don't want to due to our biases. This positive change requires shifting our core perspective. And this book will help you to take your step number one. Thank you, Gurdeep. All right, Matea, it is your turn. Please make one last argument that convinces your fellow panelists to not eliminate ducks today. 30 seconds are on the clock. All right, so the theme for this year is one book to shift your perspective. And I think that we've seen in real time for some of the panelists who haven't maybe read as many graphic novels in the past, your perspective of the medium is shifting literally as we are talking. I think that that means that this book needs to stay in the competition. To the extent that folks have raised questions of agency in the book, I think that the book provokes reflection in all of us of times where maybe we have made decisions that we knew had negative consequences or externalities on people other than ourselves. I think that, you know, we can really reflect on that and shift our perspectives, not just of Canada, but also our own personal lives. Thank you, Matea. All right, panelists, good news. I don't think you're hearing the bell again today. Uh, <laughs> that is it, it is time to vote. You have your ballots in front of you. Please mark an X beside the book that you want to eliminate from the competition. Once you have voted, Bridget from the Canada Reads team will take your ballot. And I'll remind everyone that there are no secret ballots on Canada Reads. Voting taking a little longer sorry, sorry, today sorry. than it was yesterday. Radeep, I saw you hold that and press it between your hand, that ballot, just to make sure that you'd made the right decision. Mm. Yeah. Disneem, you took a, a little while to yeah. 
Make sure of your decision. Things changed. Well, which title will be the next to go? Will it be Ducks by Kate Beaton? Matea Roach is championing that graphic memoir. Will it be Hotline by Dimitri Nasrallah? This novel was selected by Gurdip Pandare. Will it be Greenwood by Michael Christie? Keegan Connor Tracy is supporting that title. Or will it be Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel, the book chosen by Michael Gray Eyes? This is obviously a tense time. You wonder if you've you got the chance to say enough or say all the right things, leave it all out there or hold on to certain things for later. And you hope obviously that you continue in the in the competition. And they'll have to play mine in slow-mo just for people to be able to hear it. Yeah. I feel like it makes it, you know, the 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 timing really gets a little tense for people that that bell comes along. It's like I had more to say, but as you see, we don't want to rush the voting either. This is an important time for everyone to get you know, some thought about uh, how they're going to vote and digest what they have heard. I think you've got some great arguments out today. I don't think anybody should feel like <laughs> things were left unsaid. It's uh, well discussed. There's lots more to say, though. <laughs> There's always <laughs> lots more to There's say. Lots more to say. Always, always. That is uh, that is part of the Canada Reads format. <laughs> leaves leaves you wanting yeah. a little more. It's like those yeah. cooking all shows, the though. They're like cook a meal for 800 people, and you have 45 minutes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, a, a, few and more a fork. <laughs> you know. You yeah. could have cooked a few more things. <laughs> yeah. always, uh, should I have, should I have boiled those <laughs> potatoes? <laughs> Yeah, you all, uh, plates you all boiled your plates down, chef. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is exactly when you ring the bell. It's a little bit of a, you know, yeah. hands yeah. down, hands back. I, I feel that like when you are talking, you are not relying on your notes. Thank you you sure. end up saying something different. Yeah. Yeah. This is why right. I don't write that many notes to begin with. <laughs> I have the balance. Mine, so I... <laughs> Let's go through it. Michael Gray Eyes, which book did you vote against? I voted against um, Greenwood today. Okay. We have one vote against Greenwood. Gurdip Pandare, which book did you vote against? Sadly, I voted against the book. I loved reading it. Um, I also voted against Greenwood. Okay. We have two votes against Greenwood. Keegan Connor Tracy, how did you vote? Um, painfully, but I, I, because it's really one of the books I liked the most, I just, I have to think of my job, which is to say which book shifts perspective, and I just didn't feel like Station Eleven shifts perspective, even though I genuinely loved it. We have one, one vote against Station Eleven and two votes against Greenwood. Tasneem Gidi, how did you vote? As much as I loved it and I loved hearing everyone's thoughts, I voted against Ducks. We have one book, uh, one vote against Ducks, one against Station Eleven, and two against Greenwood. Matea Roach, how did you vote? Uh, I unfortunately also voted against Greenwood. With three votes against Greenwood, that does mean that Greenwood has been eliminated. All right, well, I know you had very high hopes. You came in here very, very passionate, Keegan. Let me ask you how you're feeling. I feel, honestly, I... <sighs> Maybe this is too frank. I, I do, look, it's still shifted perspective for me, but I think with that as the tagline of this year, I don't think it is necessarily the strongest book to shift perspective. Obviously, that's the job I had, and I tried to um, support that and champion it in that, in that light. I just think it's a great book that's really worth reading, and I don't think that that's in question. I don't have no issue with that. Um, and in the way that I said, I, I, Station Eleven, I didn't think it shifted perspective. I do think, in particular, these two books do, and, and so I accept that. And I really still think that this put this book in a lot of hands, um, and it's really worth reading, and I'm proud of that, and it's been a wonderful thing. It's been wonderful to talk writing with Michael and books with everybody that is also passionate about it. So I'm Thank good. Thank you, Keegan. Yeah. Looking forward to hearing you in the remainder of the week. And you I are have so a much free less agent. homework now. <laughs> Your pressure is off. <laughs> and as I said about Tasneem yesterday, you need to be wooed. As a, as a uh, free agent, people will have to take your opinion into consideration. But for today, that is goodbye to Greenwood. We have three books left. Ducks by Kate Beaton, championed by Matea Roach. Hotline by Dimitri Nasrallah, backed by Gurdip Pandare. And Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel, championed by Michael Gray Eyes. We have two days, two eliminations, a lot of spirited debate and discussion ahead of us until we find the one book all of Canada should read. Thank you.
<laughs> That's, uh, today's debate is over, but let's continue the conversation. Let's talk about what went down today. So uh, Greenwood, I mean, yeah, it's an interesting thing talking about shifting your perspective. And uh, I kind of wanted to go through, Michael, I know there were things you enjoyed about this book. Did it shift your perspective? What, what, what did you like about this book? I think this book is magnificent. It's, it's like, a, a, as a literary work, I'm utterly impressed by it. The construction is so elegant. Um, the characters are maddening and beautiful and three-dimensional. Um, as Keegan said, you know, the, the, the frame of this year's competition um, is a tricky one, you know, because I, this is not a book that I would have, you know, picked up off the shelf, you know, a book about, you know, uh, settler Canadians that, you know, didn't really deviate into the sort of the diversity of our, of our country as it is, sort of like caught through this like really interesting frame, this beautiful chase across the country, um, stopped in Saskatchewan, which I loved. Um, but in the end, I didn't, it didn't change who I thought or what I thought about Canada, Canada's history, Canada's history of dispossession, that it, that, that, you know, uh, our nations have been ignored, you know, um, the, the, the book ignored our nations, you know, again, even I would disagree that's with that. It, it was, not, they were not mentioned what in its several, intention uh, was. It wasn't, but I would disagree that it ignored them. But it certainly was not a, a focus of it. Yeah, I mean, again, like so many, so many books, um, you know, have a focus, but that focus never comes through our world, you know. And and so again, it it didn't. I, I was like, these are old stock Canadians, you know, like these are captains of industry and. I've, I've, I've read many books about them already. Yeah, sure. Uh, but impugned as such, I think also, I, I think definitely. Um, and I think perhaps maybe I should have hammered more on the environmental message because I do think, uh, although I think it was one of the challenging things about the book and I kept likening it to like, it was the pill inside the peanut butter, you know, mm. um, and, and kind of a bitter one at that. And, um, and I can be honest now and say that when I first was given this book, it was probably a year ago, and I started reading the beginning, and I was like, nope, because I just didn't want, you know, I didn't want to deal with that in the way I didn't want to deal with the pandemic. Um, but I do think it made me think, like, 2038 is not far away. And if we think it's some distant future thing, uh, that, like, a blight is a real possibility. Let's look at Dutch elm, let's look at the pine beetle, even what it's doing to the Western forests. Um, and I think in that respect, perhaps that's what I should have hammered more on in terms of shifting perspective about that. It really made me think about how vulnerable our forests are. Given yeah, so the man of the forest should uh, yeah, yeah, probably weigh um, in at this point, yeah? Yeah, yes. Um, I live uh, um, uh, in boreal forest. There's a 360 forest around me and, and living in the cabin. I connected with, the, with this book in so many ways. Uh, one specific way I connected with this book is, uh, uh, yes, there's a family history from generation to generation, but not only the family by blood, there's uh, family members who are acquired or adopted. Um, like, I just loved that, uh, uh, that, that connection between a Willow, uh, uh, a Temple, and Everett. Uh, I love the, the connection between uh, Liam and Harris. And I love that Jake, at the end, is decided, decides to adopt uh, a stranger child. And, uh, and, and it shows, like, embracing other people who are not our own. And that uh, multidimensional love uh, really created love for me for this book. Uh, yeah, it was hard to vote. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. so, um, let me ask you, Matea. Yeah, I think I loved, so I criticized Greenwood in my comments earlier. I did love it as a family story. I thought that particularly the story of Harris and Everett and Harris specifically, his narrative, like really hit me in a way that I felt, you know, I felt emotional reading it. But I do think that I, I wanted the book to shift my perspective on sort of the environmental issues a bit more than it actually did. And I felt that it used it more as like thematic dressing for the family story as opposed to really diving into, okay, so what's happened in our world that we have this blight in 2038? 
we're talking in the sort of earlier part of the story about just the aggressive dispossession of land and, you know, clearing Mohawks out of territory to, like, you know, log the forest. But it almost felt like a little bit flippant, even though I don't think that was the intention. I think the intention was just like, well, let's get back to the family story. But it made me want to know more about these things. And I don't think it quite succeeded in shifting my perspective on those, like, bigger societal issues. Mm -hmm. We'll have to leave it there. Friends, as you know, we work to a, a hard clock here. So that is our, uh, that's our discussion for today and that is a wrap on Canada Reads for today. I want to say thank you to uh, my panelists, Matea Roach, Pradeep Pandere, Keegan Connor Tracy, Tasneem Gidi and Michael Greyeyes. They will all be back tomorrow as will I. We'll see you then. I'm Ali Hassan. Until tomorrow, read on Canada.